Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, but uh, I guess you probably already knew that. If you like what we do here on the show, consider supporting us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Lions Led by Donkeys. Just $5 per month gets you every regular episode early, access to our community Discord, a digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, as well as its audiobook, read by me, and over five years of bonus content. By supporting the show, you support us and allow us to keep our show as it has always been ad-free. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. Once again, it's not Joe, it's Tom hosting another episode, and with me is Joe. That's right. What? No sprechen Sie Deutsch this time? What happened? Yeah, no, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save. I do have like a small German monologue for the last episode um, that I have to read out at the start in German. Sprechen Sie der Podcast? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, willkommen, uh, willkommen to mein podcast. Um, Joe, how are you? Uh, I'm tired. Uh, I have just discovered that a bug has crawled into my vape and died. Um, it is almost a hundred degrees here. <laughs> I'm dying. Uh, good, good stuff all around, you know, uh, I'm just yeah, you're, stewing you're, in my own juices. You're getting into the Andreas Bader mindset, you know, um, and if you aren't, uh, if you're kind of listening to this and like, what's going on? This is part two of our series on the Red Army faction. So if you haven't heard part one, go back and listen to part one. Uh, the tentative title, wet and sticky. <laughs> so when we last left off the wonderful Bader Meinhof group, aka the Red Army faction, aka the most annoying people on the planet, Andreas Bader, Gudrun Essling, and two others had been sent down for the arson in a department store. But at the same time as we open up this episode, so on April eleventh, nineteen sixty-eight, a man named Joseph Bachmann arrived in West Berlin from Munich carrying a hold all. Underneath his jacket, he had a pistol holstered just below his shoulder, and in the bag a second gun, ammunition, and several clippings from the right-wing newsletter Deutsche National Zeitung. This clipping, uh, the, the cutting under the date second of March, nineteen sixty-eight, read as follows: "Stop Deutsche now." Otherwise, there would be a civil war. The order of the day is stop the radical left revolution now. If we don't, Germany will become a place of pilgrimage for malcontents from all over the world. Underneath the headlines were five photographs of Rudi Deutsch uh, lined up like pictures on a wanted poster. So this, this guy's just like a 4chan poster. Yeah, this, this is, has no parallels to uh, anything political that's happening right now. Uh, Rudi not. Deutsch yeah, Rudi Deutsch was the head of the SDS. At 4.25pm, Bachmann saw Rudi Deutsch come out of number 140, Kur for Stendam, on a bicycle. He approached Deutsch, who was on his way to the pharmacy to get some medicine for his three-month-old son. Bachmann stood in his way and asked, Are you Rudi Deutsch? he asked. Yes, Deutsch replied. Filthy communist swine, said Bachmann. Then he drew his pistol... Rudy Deutsch took a couple of steps towards him, and the first shot rang out, hitting Rudy in the right cheek. I mean, credit where credit's due. Like, he had a guy confront him and pull a gun out. He's like, all right, motherfucker, let's do this. Yeah, bring this heat. <laughs> I bet you won't fucking shoot me, famous words of a guy who's about to be shot. He fell off his bicycle into the road, losing his shoes and wristwatch. Bachmann shot him twice more, hitting him in the head and shoulder. Deutsch stumbled forward a few steps and collapsed while Bachmann ran away. Bachmann hid in a construction site a few hundred metres away and took 20 sleeping tablets to complete his martyrdom, but was later saved in hospital. By 6.25pm, when the news announced Rudy had survived after having a 50-50 chance, students had already gathered around the SDS building. Jesus Christ, this guy got shot in the fucking face and head and is still alive. Yeah, this, this, this is a left-wing power. You know, you can get shot in the head and still survive. Meanwhile, the other guy brought two fucking guns to an assassination and still had to rely on sleeping pills to attempt to kill himself. Yeah, I know. that. The, the, you know, you have the solution right there in your jacket. And he also brought all this ex these extra bullets as well. Yeah, I mean, 
clearly, I mean, he tried to shoot fucking German socialist Rasputin and it didn't work out. <laughs> um, when the news broke, talk of action had already begun. The assassination attempt was seen as a direct attack on them and the entire left-wing movement. Among them was Ulrika Meinhof. As the tone became more vicious, a rumor spread that uh, as they spoke, barbed wire was being placed around the Springer building. This is the Axel Springer Publishing Group, which we spoke about in the last episode. And this news was met with laughter. The protesters saw the barbed wire as an invitation to see what secrets it was protecting. That is a, you know, a good point. Yeah. Why, why are you surrounding your publishing house with fucking razor wire? <laughs> <laughs> so, and... Someone is quoted as saying, the Springer building is now surrounded by barbed wire, so Springer expects us to attack. What shall we find when we get there? We shall come up against police cordons, but the police will hold back today because their conscience is very uneasy. They don't know cops very well. They arrived at the Springer building, former, forming a blockade of cars to stop the newspaper vans from leaving the premises. The police standing by watching. They parked their cars along the road and maneuvered them into a blockade, but Upon the appearance of the first Springer van, the police shot forward and began flipping cars manually by hand to clear the way. What are they, fucking angry Canadian hockey fans protesting yet another Stanley Cup loss? No, it was like 11 to 12 police officers to each car, one car belonging to Ulrika Meinhof. And like, bear in mind, it's the 60s. The cars are, you know, they're built out of sheet metal and they're just like... <laughs> they're quite small. Yeah, they're little Volkswagen bugs, you know, and they go and flip the cars over out of the way. That's, uh, the that's late... overkill. I mean, I'm not surprised, but like, at the same time, it's like, which, which police commander's like, fellas, I got an idea. Deadlift these motherfuckers into orbit. Yeah, you're really testing your SPD in the most kind of, te in most dangerous of manners. Uh, you may have maxed out your deadlift at the gym, but you have you ever thrown a German car out of the way of your Nazi publishing house van. <laughs> so by the late evening, there was a strong police presence and protesters began st throwing stones, bricks and Molotov cocktails. A note on those Molotov cocktails, they were handed out by one Peter Erbach. Now, we didn't speak about Peter in our last episode, but right now is the perfect point to introduce him. Uh, he was, on all accounts, an important figure within the protest movement, a plumber by trade and a handyman as well, he helped supply protesters with drugs, weapons, and the, the materials to make bombs. He would know how, I suppose. If, if anybody can build a solid pipe bomb, it'd be a plumber. Yeah, exactly. He was an aggrieved former railway worker in his mid-60s who would do handyman and repair work on many of the Berlin apartments where key figures lived, and as Bader would later recount, uh, was always going on about something in a kind of a weird way. He would deliver hour-long monologues on his past and future ventures, which were all to do with terror. I mean, bit rich, bit rich coming from Andreas Bader. Yeah, I was about to say, like Andreas Bader saying someone goes is weird because they go on at things on length. It's like this is a Spider-Man pointing at Spider-Man moment. Yeah, there's only one catch here, Joe. Peter Urbach was a counterintelligence officer from the very beginning. Ah, oh, Peter, I had faith in <laughs> you, man. Yeah. So what the fuck? What the fuck could West German intelligence agents get away with? This guy's giving out guns and and bombs and shit. I mean, this is like the the FBI of of like the seventies. Yeah, yeah. So like he was put in place because obviously the German state at this time, and particularly you know the Ber the West Berlin government was very kind of protective oh, or very kind of concerned over the growing protest movement. You know. They had throwing, you know, flour at the Shah, throwing custard, you know, this sort of thing. And it, they saw that there was a slow escalation in the amount of force that they were using. So they decided to just pour gasoline on the fire. <laughs> yeah. It also helps as well that a lot of the, you know, German government and the state at this time was made up by former Nazis as well. So, you know, who does counterintelligence best but the Nazis? That's why that they all got jobs in uh, the West German intelligence service and the Stasi. Like, yeah. you know who does this really well? The Nazis. Oh, uh, we should probably call them something else now. Yeah. So by October, the arsonist trial began. All four of the defendants, Bader, Ensling, Prohl, and Schonein, um, 
showed constant contempt for the court, consistently disrupting the proceedings, and were defended by nine lawyers, including Otto Schilly, Horst Mahler, and Professor Ernst Heinitz. I was really hoping for a representing themselves moment, because Botter seems like a guy that's like, calm down, guys, I got this. Joe, wait for part four. God damn it. <laughs> so, the trial was long and drawn out and would come to uh, and would come to be a predecessor to a common RAF tactic that would be used going forward, which I have named tactical bullshit. <laughs> this included extensive monologuing, deep political speech, and at one stage, Horst Mahler invoking Hermann Hesse's novel Steppenwolf to summarize the group's motivations as benign. Steppenwolf and Bertolt Brecht formed quite a lot of the weird, not necessarily political, but like, internal philosophy of the Red Army faction going forward. I'm going to choose to believe it's Steppenwolf, the dad rock band. <laughs> Born to be wild. <laughs> Hardly ever did a member of the Red Army faction pin down the psych- psychopathology of, a- of the group as precisely as Horst Mahler in the plea that he never delivered. At the end, he comes to the conclusion crossed out in the manuscript, from the bourgeois humanist position, the individual can preserve himself as a human being only in the abstract negation of the bourgeois world, that is, by destroying himself. The defendants were like Hesse's wolf of the steppes. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't know what kind of defense this is. I'm not a lawyer, but this seems bad. Someone call shocks. Um, <laughs> Like, this is a very bad argument if your hope is to be found anything other than guilty. Yeah, so during the trial, Ulrika Meinhof would visit Gudrun Ensling uh, and was quickly impressed by Gudrun's commitment to her beliefs and formed a friendship with the arsonist. In the end, on the 31st of October, 1968, the four would be sentenced to three years in prison. That's it? Yeah. Shit. That's That's like a life sentence now. Yeah. Well, maybe not in Germany, but like... I mean, they had Molotov cocktails, bombs, weapons. Well, no, this is for the arson in the department store. Uh, I mean, but they still did that with a bomb. Yeah. Uh, not not that, like, other kinds of arson are, are better, but <laughs> <laughs> generally you get some kind of tacked-on sentence, the fact, like, oh, no, this is a terrorist firebombing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, the the sentencing is kind of, like, strange in the summary judgment there's like reference to them being young that they're students and impressionable all this sort of thing so it is a quite generally lenient sentence that is that is true they're all i mean the, all of those things are true and i'm sure maybe if they had decent attorneys they'd be like look your honor all of my defendants here my clients they live in a weird sex cult compound um you oh, know the sex really hasn't happened yet okay well, of course, it is always leading to that. God damn it. But, uh, you know, the German state compassion and leniency is something they will soon come to regret in a little bit. I mean, I'm not saying that they're wrong. Like, you should have, you know, there should be a, a circumstances that lead to some people not getting long sentences for crimes, even if those crimes are setting a bomb. Like, mm. you know, they purposefully did it at a time where they figured that it would be empty, so they weren't trying to kill anybody. They're young. They're college students. Yeah. I mean, if this happened in the United States, like, yeah, so we should, should we just shoot them now, or should we shoot them later? I think you know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So, around this time, Ulrika Meinhof divorced her husband, Klaus Roll, relocating her and her children to Berlin. She maintained her column in Konkret but soon became disillusioned with the editorial direction, accusing it of essentially going soft and compromising on important issues. In May 1969, she organized a sit-in of the concrete offices in Hamburg and planned to issue demands made by uncompromising left-wing journalists. Always a good idea. But when they arrived, Roll had already been been informed two days earlier and had cleared the offices. When the occupiers arrived, they found an empty office guarded by police, which had not been called in by Concrete. After this, Ulrika left the publication. Uh, have you ever pissed off some like your place of work so hard they literally ghost you? Not like, don't answer your calls. They ghost your entire office. It's kind of impressive. So, a month later, and um, this is in June 1969, um, the four arsonists had been released from prison after serving only 14 months of their three-year sentence after an appeal. Hell yeah, Kings. 
They were to remain free until a decision was made in November about whether or not they would be re-remanded to return to custody. In the meantime, Bader and Ensling began to set up apprentice collectives. These groups were intended to help young people who are in the care of state institutions and affect some societal change upon those who were deemed as the most disenfranchised by the state. The Bader group, said one of them later, appeals to the apprentices because there's adventure, wild, exciting, driving. You're going into action in a minor way against anything that comes along. Getting the better of a waiter in a cafe, getting the better of this or that liberal shit. There's always something going on with the Bader group. That's why all the young people were drawn to them. Mm. It's exciting. It makes them feel like they're bigger than something like part of something bigger than themselves, you know? Yeah. Disenfranchised and, youth. Yeah. I mean, prime for recruitment. Yeah. And like you think of the context and the time, like we talked about in the last episode, generally, most young people were dissatisfied with the state of Germany and, you know, the quote unquote state as the government on both sides of the political spectrum, right wing and left wing. And there was such a high level of like youth institutionalization as well institutionalized youths are obviously going to be like much easier to radicalize are these institutionalized in so far as like prison or like just various aspects of the state because like conscription prison uh state violence it's a mix of you know state care homes orphanages youth facilities for detention but like it, it's kind of generally reaching out to like all young people who are in some way institutionalized by the state. Mm, okay, interesting. Mm. Why are there so many orphans? Uh, a war happened. Yeah, it was a long time years. ago, though. I mean, I, well, I, I suppose they would be of the same age, give or take. Their parents maybe died in the very end of the war. Yeah, or they might be like young people who were abandoned by their families. Like we're now almost kind of 23 years on from the war so like the majority of these like young people are you know in their teens they were born like after the war but you know they might have gone into you know apprenticeships or like jobs and just kind of been waylaid and gone like a little bit wild and being detained i'm gonna talk about someone who is the perfect example of this in a second Soon they would have a youth revolution within their grasp and Bader had already seen himself as the general of the Red Army. Of course he and did. Here were, and here were his soldiers. I mean, 18-year-olds, that's the age at which the Bolsheviks started the Russian Revolution. He was playing with fantasies like that. Ensling made all the arrangements. Bader simply tried to convey the spirit of the revolution. And he didn't just try. He really succeeded with these young macho characters. That's a, another quote from someone that interacted with them. So, someone who is one of these young people, is a guy called Peter Jürgen Buch. Um, he was one such young person and encountered the pair. Bader and Ensling would bring stuff like books, Coca-Cola, tobacco, and hand them out to kids in, in care, you know, pretty freely. You know, they some people argue that they did this, like, very manipulatively. I do think, and you'll kind of understand in a second, that, like, they did do this genuinely out of, like, a kind of compassion. Sure, they were trying to recruit people, but... I, I think this is actually them trying to be compassionate to young people who've been institutionalized. I could see how it could go either way. Book had gone to the Netherlands as a teenager, where he was subsequently expelled from the country after catching some drug charges and was deported back to Germany. And when he was 17, he was handed over by his parents into the care of the state. So he left Germany, went to the Netherlands because it was like this kind of like hippie utopia. People were already setting up communes. They were like living outside of like the normal way that people live. And he found and out that unfortunately he was full of the Dutch. Yes. Um, he was involved in riots and was constantly disobedient. And when he was moved to Hesse, he encountered the newly freed arsonists. Unimpressed by the Coca-Cola and tobacco, he was instead taken in by Andreas Bather's leather jacket, which true to his nature upon book commenting on its quality took it off his own back and gave it to the young man and said here you keep it so you know that goes back to that very first instant in the last episode where we talked about andreas bader will literally give someone the shirt off his back yeah i mean he also probably stole that jacket <laughs> yeah but you know I, i'll give him credit where credit's due you know giving someone a night i have i I'm wearing my nice leather jacket today i'm not giving that to anyone i mean giving away something that you stole 
it's kind of a wash, right? Like it's not you're, you're, you're not you're not Robin Hood exactly. Like you're not stealing from banks and showering these poor orphans with money. You're like, no, I shoplift this from J.C. Penny, man. You want it? I mean, J.C. Penny is still a big corporation. Yeah, fair enough. Also, it's really weird that guy's parents gave him up when he was seventeen. Yeah, but like uh, this, this, like at this time, not just particularly in Germany, but like around the world, it was like super common, particularly like in Europe, that like even if your kid's a teenager, you'll just like send them to do an apprenticeship or something just to kind of wash your hands of them. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I don't blame them. I don't have children, but I was a child once, and I wouldn't have blamed my mom for like get the fuck out of here. Yeah, instead, your parents gave you to the army. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, in another life, you could have joined the Red Army faction. Hey, we're both really good at losing wars, are we? <laughs> um, Book immediately knew these were his people and would soon run away from the institution to join them. By the time he arrived, Bader, Ensling, and the others had all contracted jaundice from sharing <laughs> the same needles while doing heroin. Ah, uh, yes, a tale as old as time. Hey, at least they only got jaundice. Yeah, true. Yeah, all the all the other diseases didn't exist at this stage. Yeah, me and my friend, you know, we care so much about you know, sharing with one another. We shared our hep C. Yeah, sharing is caring. What can I say? Yeah. Now we all share the same glowing yellow hue. Soon, the Botter group had ballooned to 30 members. So this is, you know, people from varying parts, a lot of kids coming from institutions, a lot of people who are runaways or just like seeking an outside life. So it's like most of uh, the Bowder group now, like all heroin addicts? I, I don't really know. Uh, if, they're sh- if they're sharing enough needles where everybody is riddled with jaundice, like... Well, no, it's not, it's not everybody, it's just like a few of them. Okay, because like the idea of a heroin addled terror group is like the least scariest thing on earth because it's like they're not going to set a bomb they're going to get sleepy yeah a sleepy gang (laughs) but in november the courts rejected the arsonists appeals and they were remanded back into custody instead they went on the run eventually reaching paris where they stayed with the french writer regis debray who had at one point been che guevara's comrade in arms they had sent for astrid prol uh thorwald's sister to bring them books papers and a Mercedes left in the garage in Frankfurt. They discussed what to do next in their revolutionary struggle. There was talk of contacting Fata. All the while, some of their followers would, from the care homes would sporadically show up in Paris and like tell them, like, we need you to come back to Germany. You know, there's stuff to be doing and, you know, we need you. Like these, like Ensling and Bader had like essentially sprung these kids and encouraged them to leave these care homes and like, for better or worse, these kids like relied on them and they just disappeared. Yeah, that's it's kind of dirty. Mm-hmm. Like, I will create this the, this ecosystem that you need to survive and then we're going to go have a nice uh, Parisian vacation. Yeah. So instead, all of their visitors were told to go home as there was important work being done in Paris instead. All the while, the two of them, you know, dined in cafes, went on nice walks. To- Andreas Bader took a lot of like quite cool pictures. Um, and just, like, engaged intellectually with the revolution. He'd turn into a photography guy. <laughs> um, Thorwald Prohl and Horst Sonlein turned themselves in to serve the rest of their sentences and would never be in contact with their co-conspirators again. Probably a good call in retrospect. Yeah, so the other two instead went to Italy, where they heard that their appeal for clemency had been denied. While in Italy, a tourist from Germany would happen to cross their paths, Mr. Horst Mahler, encouraging them to return and to join the now burgeoning movement that had become quite militant, as you know, it had now progressed past simply a protest movement, and now there is some milita- militancy involved. In 1970, while filming Bamboul, Ulrika Meinhof at this point feeling the strained relationship between her familial life and political life happened to be visited by Andreas Bader, who showed up at her apartment with Gudrun Ensling. Her apartment by this stage had become a sort of hub for left-wing activists, and the two needed somewhere to stay temporarily. During their two-week stay, they took some acid, chilled out, talked about the revolution, and Ulrika saw the two as good comrades, while on the other hand, her two twin daughters hated Andreas Bader. I mean, two things. For one... You know it smelled crazy in there. 
Yeah. And two, no shit they fucking hate him. This strange dude just showed up at their house. Another mom is just getting ripped out of her mind on acid instead of taking care of them. Yeah. So one story about why her daughters hated Andreas Bader. At one stage, Bettina fell and hurt her knee. And instead of helping the child, Andreas pointed at her and started laughing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course he did. He's a fucking man child. Yeah. So, at this time, uh, neither of the pair had any concrete plans for building up a body of urban guerrillas. They entertained some very vague notions of strategic activities carried out by fringe groups, which would certainly be outside the law and militant, but by no means paramilitary. Their priorities were justifying accommodation, get hold of money, and make contacts at this time. To get money, they needed arms. This is leading to a bank robbery, isn't it? No, this, it's funnier first. So after a failed attempt at stealing arms from officers patrolling the Berlin Wall. <laughs> Bold. Bold move, Cotton. So this isn't necessarily in the script, but this is such a funny story. So essentially what they did was they made cudgels out of sacks with shit in them. And they planned on like rocking up because usually there was only like a handful of officers patrolling the Berlin Wall and they're quite spaced apart. They were planning on jumping ones that were on their own and stealing their pistols. It's such a stupid plan. I mean, like, yeah. I suppose if there is no other way to get firearms, which I'm sure there, there is, they just don't have the contacts yet. Like, you don't want to attack the guys with sacks of, like, I don't know, sacks of Deutschmark coins. But, like, sacks that are remarked to have looked like big, heavy sausages. I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit you with my meat sack and steal your fucking <laughs> Walther. Yeah, so when they when they showed up at the Berlin Wall and it was kind of, you know, a dim, foggy night, instead of a lone so lone officer, they just saw shit loads of cops. Yeah. I uh, what how did they expect this is gonna get Andreas, I have a I have a foolproof plan. We're gonna ambush these men at the Berlin Wall. That's like I really need an AK I like I really need an assault rifle. I'm going to assault Fort Knox. Yeah, yeah. But luckily, their new friend Horst Mahler said that he had a possible contact for getting some pistols. He said he knew someone who had stored a box of World War II pistols in a nearby graveyard and who was a comrade of their collective struggle. The group eventually met with Mahler's contact to discuss the arms and were led to a nearby graveyard in Buckau where, where they were then led to a mound where the pistols were buried. But unfortunately, the graveyard, there's people in the graveyard walking by, so they were prevented from digging, and they decided to try in a couple of days. <laughs> this plan is, all these plans are great. These, these people are great strategists. So the following afternoon, um, Bader had been driving through Kreuzberg, uh, uh, Kreuzberg and had noticed a police car was following him. So what did he do? Immediately tried to speed away. Now, he did manage to shake the police tail, but his license plate had been, the number had been taken. God, these people are so stupid. After a, a few days later, after discussing whether or not Mahler's lead was bullshit, they went to the graveyard again. After digging up the mound for about 30 minutes and not finding any guns, Mahler's contact argued uh, that someone might have found the cash before they had the chance to retrieve it. Oh no, somebody found my corpse weapons cache. Now, there was one problem with this entire plan. Were they digging in the wrong grave? No. Okay, that would have been dumb. Do you want to know who um, Mahler's contact for the guns was? Oh, it, it was the fucking intel agent, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Peter Erbach. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but like, th this is something that... Like, were the cops waiting for them, or is he just playing a fucking prank on them? Just wait. So, when they returned to their cars, they were immediately approached by police and asked for their paper. And uh, they provided their papers. Um, Andreas Bader was immediately caught out lying about falsified papers that he had stolen and was promptly arrested. It says here your name is not... You says your name is not Andreas Bader? Yes, but that see, is the correct. Like, the, the thing is, is that in the, like, very specific details of this incident, it's very clear that he stole this ID, but never looked at it. <laughs> so he knew the, like, he knew the person's name, 
but like the information of like how many kids he had he couldn't get right and like the picture is like a turkish man with a long mustache yeah Uh, no you don't understand officer i wasn't trying to find guns i was simply grave robbing yeah so obviously urbach had sold them out to the police but nobody was suspicious of urbach afterwards how could they not be they're either the most trusting people on earth or the dumbest people who have ever called themselves a terrorist group where did you learn the location of these guns oh the my my friend and he's the only only one who talked to you about this yes he dropped horse Mahler like back into town after this happened he comes off taking off his, like, officer's peaked cap and be like, Oh no, what happened? Why did you not find the pistols? <laughs> Why do you have a police radio in your car? Oh, no reason. I am, a, I am an AM FM enthusiast. <laughs> oh, those are the worst. Why do, you have this pol- Why do you have this police badge? I really like uniforms. <laughs> so, Bader was taken to Tegel Prison, where he was due to serve out the rest of his sentence. In the aftermath, his friends began to formulate a plan they of how they could... They didn't even add any extra time to his sentence? No, they were just like, okay, we'll just bring you back. Because the crime wasn't trying to dig up the guns or whatever. It was literally, they just wanted to get him back into prison. So, they didn't even charge him with the crime he was obviously committing. They just threw him back in prison for his previously established crime. Yeah, because, like, some people argued that, like, Peter Urbach hadn't actually told the police, and it's because Bader's plates were taken the day before, and the police just happened to notice that, oh, that's the same car that was, like, speeding yesterday that we were tailing. Yeah, but speeding is gonna get your parole revoked. After he was arrested, he was brought to the police station where his identity was confirmed that, oh, this is Andreas Bader. And he f- stole paperwork and misrepresented, re- misrepresented himself. And they're like, you know what? You're so stupid. We're not even going to tack <laughs> on more time. We're, we're, we're just going to put you in prison for the remainder, like six weeks of your terror charge or whatever. They began formulating a plan of how to spring him from custody. They eventually settled on this idea. Ulrika Meinhof was going to pose as if she was writing a book with Bader one which would require him to be moved from the prison to access research materials in the social studies building in Dal- in Dalem. Also, I'm sorry to any German that's listened to this. You know, I- I'm doing my best. Of the three of us, one of us speaks German and he's not here. This was the exact plan that they went with. On one of her visits, Ulrika Meinhof asked if it was possible for Andreas Bader to be allowed out of the prison to look at literature on the subject. They were writing a book about, you know, social issues facing young people. Andreas Bader isn't, you know, the intellectual titan that a lot of people think he is, but whatever. Yeah, der social issues. Um, yeah. Okay, not only is Bader and his group dumber than hell, so are the police. Everybody here is so stupid. There is so many incidents of the police being stupid as shit throughout this entire series. Throughout history. Uh, Wait until I get to the ham sandwiches in part four. Ugh. I, I like the fact that, you know, he's doing a prison term of a couple months. And like They're like, <laughs> this clearly can't wait. This book must be written now. Yeah. So she argued that he should be allowed out of prison, you know, to look at books and literature on the subject. There were journals of the 20s uh, at the Academic Institute in Berlin, which he absolutely must read uh, for the book they were planning. Uh, Governor Glaubrecht refused and he said, we just don't have the staff to escort him out several times. Bader's lawyer, Horst Mahler, uh, happened to be in Tegel at the time, and he was not standing for this and insisted at, on speaking to the governor at once. He then pulled out all the stops. Nobody else, he said, could pick relevant material from the card index of authors on Bader's behalf. Bader had to do it himself. Yeah, he's just, his brain is so big. Nobody can compare, you see. I mean, when you if you look at pictures, that dude had a fucking massive head. Research assistants, what are they? <laughs> so, Glaubrecht seemed to take this point and agreed to a single outing lasting two to three hours. Mahler told Bader, who had just had a visit from Ulrika Meinhof, of the success of his efforts. When the lawyer had left, Glaubrecht asked for Bader's file. On the same day, one of the 
prison governor's staff called the Institute of Social Studies and made the appointment for the prisoner to go there in two days' time on Thursday the 14th of May, 1970, at 9am. Oh, we get a time and a date. That's not a good sign. (laughs) And on the 14th of May, 1970, at 9am, when the time came, Andreas Brader was sprung for custody, a shooter armed with two silenced pistols that they had bought in the previous weeks. Oh, sick. So was, were they were they like wielding guns at Kimbo because they have no idea what they're doing? Literally, literally. So unfortunately, I don't have the time to like go into the specifics of this. But if you buy Stefan Aust's uh, Bader Meinhof Complex, which I've used extensively in addition with other materials for this series, you can like the first like three chapters is about him being sprung from prison at this time. It's, it's really, really good. He was sprung from custody with armed violence at the Institute of Social Issues in West Berlin, district of Dalheim. George Linke, one of the staff of the Institute, had been severely wounded in the course of the operation, having been shot in the leg, chest and shoulder. Bader and his rescuers got away. Where do you think they're going to go next? Uh, They're not very bright, so I'm going to assume to the intelligence agent's house. (laughs) No, but... On the 8th of June, 1970, a group of West Berlin travellers flew to Beirut from East Berlin's Schoenfeld Airport. Oh, they'll do it, yeah. Later, the police found the pseudonyms of the Bader Meinhof group on the plane. What year is this? So this is 1970. Okay, great time to be in Lebanon. So the names included Bakker, Grasov, Schlem, Mahler, Dudin, and Ray, and there was others on the passenger list. The French journalist Michel Ray had obviously left her passport in Berlin. Saeed Dudin, acting as an intermediary between the group and the PLO's Al Fatah organization, had bought their air, air tickets at the Kareem Travel Agency in West Berlin. The first group landed in Beirut at half three in the afternoon. That's 3.30 for all you Americans. Thank you. And from there, they were supposed to tra- continue to Amman in Jordan. Their journey ended in a training camp a few kilometers outside of Amman, on the road to Jerusalem. The camp lay on a plateau plateau surrounded by karstified hills in the middle of a mountainous desert. It consisted of two stone buildings, an open space for military exercises, a concrete indoor shooting range, some tents. That was all. The group began their training. I'm I'm going to assume these nice, cushy, soft German college students are not going to like PLO training camp. (laughs) Oh, Joe. (laughs) Ten days after the first group arrived, Saeed Dudin returned to Berlin with a clutch of Arab United Arab Republic passports bearing photograph of Bader's rescuers in his baggage. And on the 12th of June, the second group, which included Andreas Bader, Gudrun Edsling and Ulrike Meinhof, were driven to Nekolun, I, I can't pronounce that, by friends, uh, where they took the underground to Friedrichstrasse station and East Berlin and flew on from there. Then you know the way you said that the police seem really stupid? Yeah. They li- the East German police literally made no trouble at all and it pretty much seemed like they didn't know who was, t- who was being transported. I mean, I don't think they would have cared. The PLO is a pretty big ally of uh, of East Germany, uh, and I mean the Soviet Union. Uh, I I don't think they would have stopped. Like, oh, you have an arrest warrant in West Germany. Let us yeah. go. Let us stop you. They're like, no, you have an arrest warrant in in, in West Germany. Please go on ahead. Yeah. So uh, they arrived, but there was problems in the airport. But the Palestinians intervened. The group was held at the airport for only a few hours, and Saeed Dudin who alone was allowed to leave, came back with a piece of paper and four armed Palestinians. The travelers were then allowed to leave the airport. That is just as good as a visa. If you're stopped at customs, there's a good chance you get left let through if a large gang full of armed men come up to let you through. Yeah, I don't travel anywhere without my armed Palestinians. I mean, I got them right here. Yeah, it's the new range from Samsonite. Yeah, I, I like. am I going to apply for a visa or am I going to get... Eight to ten flat nosed geezers with AKs. <laughs> so, with the group now fully in training mode, they set about about learning the basics of marksmanship, tactics, and conditioning training. So, you know, they're doing their they're doing the kipping pull ups. You know, they're doing burpees. They're you didn't invent desert CrossFit. 
<laughs> now, one thing that they, they did do, train with conditioning, you know, to keep your physical fitness included, like stuff like running, stuff like push-ups, just like very basic stuff. Cardio is very important to the revolution. But it became immediately apparent that Bader was unhappy with the arrangements that had been made for them. <laughs> he bemoaned the living quarters being gender segregated, the meager rations given to them, this is according to him, and the intense physical training that was asked of them. Dude, you went to a PLO training camp. It's not a fucking timeshare. The, the revolution is not based on treats. So he would spend hours ranting about these issues. And when I'm going to get you to explain to people listening the importance of this person, when Palestinian leader Abu Hassan arrived. Oh, no. <laughs> and was cooked a freshly killed chicken. He called his hosts authoritarian prov for providing the commander meat, but none for them. So, Joe, can you explain to the people why Abu Hassan is such an important person? So Abu Hassan is a nom de guerre of Ali Hassan Salome. He is, uh, <laughs> he is one of the, I believe, the ch one of, if not the chief architects of the Black September group of the, the of, you know, uh, Olympic attack in Munich fame. Mm -hmm. um, he's a big fucking deal. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, those attacks I don't believe have happened yet. He, he's a he's he's a big fucking deal. Um, he is. Oh man, it's uh, that's like being if you're if you're a terrorist and like Timothy McVeigh hangs out with you. Like, why does Timothy get the TV controller? <laughs> also, you know, his father was like. You know, part of the, you know, World War II Kingdom of Iraq, the Palestinian War of 47 and 48. Yeah. You know, yeah, he comes it, from a long line of important dudes in Palestine. Yeah, so he's a he's a big fucking deal. And this German guy is really mad because he got a cooked chicken before he did. Yeah. I like, you know, it's also kind of important that yeah, I, you could vaguely call Ali Hassan Salome and even the PLO vaguely left wing at this point, but they're Palestinian nationalists. Like that's the whole point. They don't. They don't give a fuck about his, like uh, what's his name, uh, Bader's Puritan politics in the desert. They're like, shut the fuck up, man. You fucking nerd. In response to his demands not being met the collective group went on strike from training. This included not showing up for shooting, uh, conditioning, sunbathing nude out in the open. This literally only affects themselves. Bear in mind, this is the PLO in the 70s. They had never had women in their training camps before. Yeah, it's, it's you know, thankfully, um, you know, the Middle East, the 1970s, uh, very into, uh, like, nude sunbathing. Yeah. So, not only did Bader set his sights on the members of the PLO and Fatah and, you know, his hosts, he also set his sights on Ulrika Meinhof, berating her as a useless intellectual for messing up a grenade practice. So, they were doing, you know, grenade training, she pulled the pin and smoke started to come out and kind of panicked and held on to it. Oh, outstanding. And then threw it away, like, at the last minute, so, like, no one was hurt. They all had to dive behind, like, rocks and stuff. Yeah, I'm sure the safety conditions of a PLO training camp is you either get the grenade training right, or you're no longer training because you have you've been blown to pieces. <laughs> yeah, so, like, Bader, you know, tore strips off Meinhof over this. He also targeted Peter Homan, at one stage physically assaulting him when Homan fought back and knocked Bader to the ground. Ensling and the other women screamed at him, calling him a bastard and saying that he had knocked him out. It turns out uh, Bader should have gone to the fucking physical training more often. Yeah, exactly. Um, after this, Homan was considered a traitor to the cause. <laughs> you're, you're a traitor to the cause because you hurt my feelings? Yeah, the group subsequently turned on him and as tensions rose to a head Holman ho overheard them one evening discussing how they could shoot him and make it look like an accident i mean they're probably right um i'm going i'm, I'm gonna go on a limb here and assume that these guys are not the best at handling weapons seeing how they've been striking weapons training for a while <laughs> yeah so a few days after the nocturnal conversation on the terrorist abu hassan spoke briefly with Holman 
once more about the Berliners and their journey. He said to Homan, you came as friends and will certainly be conducted out as friends, according to the laws of Arab hospitality. He would, he said, arrange another meeting between Homan and the main group so that they could discuss the procedure for travelling together. The discussions in a small Amman hotel were brief. Homan wanted to go his own way. They essentially conducted like a struggle session on him. That's the least surprising thing you've told me so far. So the group flew back to Schoenfeld Airport in East Berlin and traveled over to West Berlin Underground by train. The police never noticed anything. Great. Uh, uh, guys, I tried to go train at a terror camp, but I got washed out for it. Like, they, the police hadn't even figured out the apartments that they were using as hideouts before they left for Jordan. So these apartments could be used again. I mean... It, the West German and West Berlin, like West German federal police in general, were kind of notoriously incompetent. I mean, for more information, this read about the Munich massacre. Um, so none of this surprises me. They're not good. They, it seemed like the vast majority of their you know, crime fighting or investigative ability, as much as any cop cops do this, was based mostly on the, the hope that people would just follow the law. <laughs> they wouldn't have to do anything. Yeah, so then the Palestinians provided Homan with an Arab passport in the name Omar Sharif, and uh, they gave him his forged German passport back, 200 US dollars for the journey, and an air ticket from Beirut to Rome. A week after the others arrived in Berlin, he went through passport control at Rome Airport. He bought a ticket and boarded a train back home to Hamburg that evening. See, they actually sent him to Rome as a punishment. You failed out of PLO camp, and, and you're, uh, the way that you will suffer for this is for sending you to Italy. Yeah, no, no. What they really did to make him suffer is they bought him an airfare from uh, uh, Beirut to Rome on Wizz Air. <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you for buying me my ticket. He shows up to the terminal. He's like, no, no. I mean, to be fair, the PLO definitely don't have uh, air miles with Lufthansa anyway. <laughs> well, certainly not anymore. <laughs> so now we need to talk about something that's really sad oh. so in the summer of 1970 Stefan Aust, writer of the Badermeinhof complex, got a phone call from Hamburg, prior to this he had tried to get hold of Peter Holman uh, to make contact with Ulrika Meinhof, um, he knew Ulrika from his times working at Concrete, over the phone he was told to go to Himmelstrasse in Hamburg where he would find Holman dyeing his hair in the bathroom there he was told of a plan to send Meinhof's twin daughters to a Palestinian orphanage in Jordan. You see, shortly after Bader had been freed from prison, Ulrika had arranged for her children to be smuggled out of the country to Italy, where they would remain until sent for. The plan was then to send them to be trained by the PLO and eventually become revolutionary fighters for the cause. Oh my god, also, she said it turned her children into child soldiers? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. God. Also, since their mother was now on the run, it was believed that they would be safe from state retaliation from their mother's crimes. Oust immediately travelled to Palermo under the recommendations of Homan that time was of the utmost importance, and when he arrived, the children's handlers noticed his baggage labels were from Hamburg Airport and not Berlin, like they were expecting. He told them he used, he used to work at Concrete with Ulrika and was brought to the children. Soon he was stood outside a dilapidated Volkswagen minibus on a deserted beach and found Betna and Regine sitting inside. The two girls recognised him from the cr concrete days and seeing him around the office and he returned them to their father Klaus Roll, who just so happened to be on holiday in Italy at the time. A few days later, a call from Berlin arrived in Sicily. We'll be fetching for the children in a few days. But you already did. They're gone, was the response. Back in Berlin, preparations for the underground struggle began. Apartments were rented, cars stolen, and sympathizers contacted. Ulrika Meinhof was experiencing bouts of guilt over her children. Do you want to know what Andreas Bader's response was? I'm going to assume something like, shut up. He called her a bourgeois cunt. Uh, uh, of course he did. What happened to her kids? They, they just stayed with their father. Well, that's a better alternative. Yeah. Then, you know, then, you know be, becoming literal child soldiers. Yeah. And everybody knows having children is a, is a sign of being a, you know, a privileged uh, individual, a privileged class, class trader. Having, 
having human emotions is counter revolutionary. I can't imagine how horrible it would it sounds to be called a bourgeois cunt in German. <laughs> I have a feeling someone will tell us. If you know, tell us. <laughs> and uh, after this, she mentioned it no more. Wait, she just like abandon her children? Yep, pretty much. Wow, what a winner. But the most pressing issue was money. They planned bank robberies and contacted a mechanic called Carl Heinz Ruland, who was deep in debt at the time and was sympathetic to their cause. He retrofitted stolen cars with more powerful engines, resprayed them, and gave them new bodywork numbers in order to make them untraceable. Zero hour for the planned raids was the morning of the 29th of September. Three Berlin banks were raided between 9.48 a.m. and 9.58 a.m. This was one of the rare cases between the Red Army faction and the June 2nd movement, or the 2nd of June movement, depending on which way you want to work it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the bank robberies because there's one that we have to talk about quite a lot in the next episode. So you'll, get, you'll understand their tactics in the next episode. For his work, Heinz received 1,000 Deutschmarks. A week after the triple coup, as the group called it, they all met in an apartment in uh, Kufenstrasse for a post-mortem of the operation. Over coffee and beer, they discussed the course of the bank raids. Mahler and Bader thought they could improve on their techniques of entering and getting away from the bank. Mahler wearing his toupee as usual. Oh, I forgot to say that horse Mahler wore a toupee. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, offered moral justification for the raids. It's the capitalist money we take. It doesn't harm the little man. And no need to worry about the trauma you cause all the people involved by pointing guns at them. Yeah. So, Bader thought the group should grow. Then he said that Bakker and Ali Jensen, a member of the group since returned from Jordan, had to go to Munzenlager to find out about the chances of breaking into an army arsenal in order to secure more weapons. Obviously, they're not going to go digging in graveyards anymore first raiding the Berlin Wall, now breaking into a, a, a army base. Dream big. Over the course of the next few months, they recruited more members to the cause, as well as organizing raids on town halls. You see, one of the biggest logistical issues were papers. If you were stopped by the police, you would be summarily asked to show identification and will be queried about it, like what happened with Bader during the Peter Arbach graveyard incident. So the plan was to hit as many town halls as possible in order to secure blank passports, identity papers, along with stamps, official seals, and headed paper. With these, they could, e- they could easily forge realistic enough documents to fool any police officer, even for a few minutes, which would be enough to, for anyone caught on the back foot to escape. It was during the winter when people like Jan Karl Rasp, Holger Mines, Bette Strum and Ulrich Scholz, among others, will be recruited into the group. The later political manifestos of the group harped on about the primacy of praxis. Whether it is right to organise armed resistance now depends on whether it is possible. That could be ascertained only in practice. In their life outside of the law, the primacy of praxis became a commonplace reality. Apartments would be requisitioned, cars stolen, sources of money found, i.e. banks raided, and the organization of daily life underground was increasingly replacing political discussions. They were on the run, a fact which determined the group's life more than any strategic notion of their aims. Obviously, if you're on the run from the police, the most important thing you can do is like figure out, okay, one, how are we not going to get caught? How are we going to fund everything? Like, we got to feed people, we got to yeah. pay you know, rent on apartments, which we falsify documents to rent, blah, 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 blah. During this time, do you want to know what they used as their kind of central operations base? Uh, I'm going to swing for the fences here. Uh, like a college library. An abandoned sanatorium. Hell yeah, that's way cooler. They used the, an abandoned sanatorium outside of Bad Kissingen as their base. On the afternoon of the 14th of December, Ruland and Astrid Prohl drove to Bad Kissingen where they stole oil stoves, lamps, and electric cable. The next day, Bader, Ensing, Janssen, Rasp, and his former girlfriend, Marianne, arrived at the sanatorium. Meinhof, Mines, and Strom joined them later that evening. They discussed future operations, and it all struck uh, Betty Sturm as nonsense. She had never known the group except on the run. Its members felt they were constantly under observation, being pursued, and generally just having, like, the most paranoia cloud living above them. Were the police even onto them? 
kind of okay. like like they were looking for people like Bader and Meinhof and Ensing, but like the rest of them, no one really knew they were even involved. She thought it absurd to be talking at this point of such grandiose projects such as kidnapping, but Bader in demanded action. Perhaps they could kidnap the newspaper publisher Axel Springer and thus bring pressure to bear to get the prisoners in Berlin freed. They went back and forth on potential targets, CDU politicians, Social Democrat Chancellor Franz Josef Strauss, uh, maybe more bank grades. They couldn't really settle on anything. The meetings in the old sanatorium were unplanned and disorganized. The building was neglected and furniture was almost completely missing. Ruland had installed some oil stoves in three of the rooms. The rest remained uninhabitable because bear in mind, it's December in Germany. And they're living in an abandoned sanatorium. It's nice and warm, you know, well, well, well insulated. Certainly not a giant refrigerator full of smelly <laughs> revolutionaries. So after a few days, they had all had enough of each other's company in this absolute shithole. And they set out again to prepare for bank raids in the Ruhr. I mean, this is a group that kind of failed in like the austere training environment of a PLO training camp. At least it's warm in Jordan. I mean, it's nothing but warm in Jordan, right? Yeah. And now they're like, oh, we have set up our revolutionary headquarters. It's this crust punk shithole. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why anybody thought they were actually going to be able to tough this out. Yeah, exactly. But, um, Homesickness and, quite frankly, sickness for each other began to set in when they were planning the next round of raids. Karl Heinz was arrested on suspicion of helping the group, and infighting began with Scholz accusing Bader of irresponsibly encouraging members to break the law. Bader reacted as expected. You can't half-heartedly take part in a group's illegal life and then go back within the law again. Do you want to know when he made this criticism of Bader? Mm, I'm going to guess when he did just that. No, when Bader was showing him how to use an AK-47. No, it was a, it was a Kalashnikov submachine gun. Sorry, I don't want the gun people to get mad at me. So Bader is there with a Kalashnikov submachine gun, showing you how to shoot, and you decide to criticize him. Not really a good idea. That was Bader. No, he's kind of a dick. I, if anybody is is going to go off the like out of the pocket and just shoot you in the back, it'd be him. So they all met again in Nuremberg late at night. Ulrich Schultz and Astra Prohl had driven to Waltzmannstrasse, where Ulrike Meinhof and Ali Janssen uh, were waiting. They had picked out a Mercedes that they were planning to break into because cars at this stage, pretty easy to steal. Like, you know, oh, now yeah. you need like an, an electronic fob. That, yeah, you could probably break into those back then with a, with a coat hanger and then like hot wire them in five seconds. Yeah, like you used to be able to do the screwdriver trick, whereas if you got like a flathead screwdriver and put it in the ignition and then hit it with a hammer hard enough, it would break all of the the actual like lock on the ignition and you could just turn the screwdriver. <laughs> Hell yeah. So they managed to break into it and, you know, hot wire the car, but the car refuses to start backfiring and the sudden noise like he stole the a backfire- piece of shit. <laughs> the backfire, you know, woke its owner who was asleep who called the police. He opened his window and shouted for help. They were all like, oh shit, what are we going to do? And they all jumped out of the car and ran into their own car. Uh, Ulrika ran to her car, a BMW, which Astro Pro, the best driver out of all of them as it happened, and they both raced away. The two women turned into the car park of an SO hotel. The men drove straight on. They stopped just before they reached the Meister Singer uh, Hall and got out. Ulrich Schultz was about to lock the car down when a Volkswagen drew up beside them. Two police officers in plain clothes asked for their papers. (laughs) Schultz, do you want to know what he did? I'm going to assume he just tried to run away. He gave them his actual driver's license. Oh my god. These guys are running away is a better option here somehow. These guys are so stupid. Did he, like, mix them up? Because he obviously had fake papers on him at any given time. But, like, time. bear in mind, it was, they weren't really under suspicion of, like, trying to break into the car. It was probably they got pulled over because they were speeding. The, the, there's one thing you learn from a heist film. It's that when you commit a crime, you always get away in the most obvious fashion. So everybody like, hey, look, a criminal. The fact that they were speeding probably made the police more suspicious of them. And they said, you know... Someone's tr- after trying to break into a car in Watzmannstrasse 
and they said can you get in the back of the police car just come with us and let the you know car owner have a look at you yeah, that reminds me like uh, going back to timothy mcveigh somehow he was pulled over because he had no license plate on his car because he was a sovereign citizen he didn't think he needed one He's a fucking moron. Yeah, sometimes you gotta stop telling on yourself. Yeah, when you're committing crimes and using a car for a getaway vehicle, you have to be... like It's very easy to just be normal. Go the speed limit, have a driver's license, uh, have, a, have a fucking license plate on your car. Yeah, like, how easy is it to get away with crimes? You've like, already stolen so many cars. Like, well, how are you missing the de- like the minute detail? You've robbed banks, and you can't think like, hey, maybe we should have the speed limit and we get away from here so we can blend in. Uh, Ali and Uli were told to get into the two police cars each separately. Uli got into the Volkswagen with the plainclothes police and drove off. The uniformed men took Ali Anson, uh, who had produced a forged identity car, to the patrol car standing a little way off. He was... You know, they were going to check his license, they're going to bring him back to the station, and they were going to frisk him. Fortunately, Ali opened his coat, flicked it backwards, and s- swiftly pulled out a pistol. The officer oh grabbed his God. wrist and tried to get the gun away from him. Janssen struggled, shouting, Get away, let go of me, or I'll shoot. He had his index finger on the trigger and was swinging the barrel to point first at one policeman, then the other, you know, swinging back and forth, fighting with them. And eventually, one of the police officers just said, okay, we need to run. They both ran, and Ali just started shooting randomly. Then tried to steal the police car. Great idea. No, no way they'll catch you in that. But when he tried to start the car, the police started shooting at him and, like, telling him to stop. He's like, stop, stop. And he got himself, you know, across the passenger seat and out of the patrol car, putting up his hand, but the pistol was still in his ha- in his right hand. <laughs> He was told to throw the gun away. He threw the gun away, and the policemen tackled him, but they slipped. <laughs> because the ground was slippery with snow. He deployed so many bananas like it was Mario Kart. <laughs> Ali was taken into you know, police custody. He was strip-searched. His clothes were searched. He, they fucked up his nose when he fell over on the ice. Yeah, I'm sure that was an accident. But the others went on. Life in the underground was hard. It was, you know... Astrid Prohl at one stage said it was always like this. You were somewhere or other then something or other happened and you had to move everything, go somewhere to completely different. Once when she had been arrested in Frankfurt, she lapsed into a deep psychological low. I'd done everything wrong again or maybe we'd all done something wrong to get us into this situation in the first place. As usual on the German left, the members of the Red Army faction were always always criticising each other instead of supporting... <laughs> Uh, quote, instead of supporting people when they need help, they slag you worse than ever. That's how it always is in the group. Wow, what a great uh, environment for team building. You know, they really need to hire like one of those HR professionals to pass the ball around the group and everybody says something like two things positive and two things that you can approve upon. Give them the good compliment sandwich. Um, you know, do some team building exercises, maybe a trust fall or two. So, with one member in custody and the morale at an all-time low, that is where we end part two. Join us again in part three when everyone argues even more. Who would have thought? Yeah. I I am amazed at how bad these people are at terrorism. They get better at it. I'll give them that. They get better at it. Only because the cops are so stupid, they give them the opportunity to continuously get better at it. The only reason those other guys are even arrested is because one of them decided to start fucking shooting like his, uh, like Yosemite Sam. But Joe, are you excited for part three when we get more bombs, more bank raids, more arguing, and more shootouts? I mean, I know a little bit about some uh, better Meinhof attacks, so I know things get depressing. Um, but it's you know th- these people j- just sound fucking insufferable to me. Mm-hmm. Also, one small detail that I <laughs> I left out. When they sprung Andreas Bader from prison, he was still suffering from jaundice. Uh, we will we'll lead the revolution tomorrow. I have to take a small nap. Like, oh, our our comrade has nodded off again. All right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is true, you know, uh, involve, invoking the spirit of the Bolsheviks. Your, your heart is red with communism and your 
skin is yellow with jaundice. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think as heroin as a as a as a revolutionary drug, uh, you know, uppers because you know you live you you live in a shithole and you're running constantly and trying to get away from the police. You know, you're going to be banging lines of coke. Or, I mean, they're German, the, the meth and pervitin or whatever, right? Like, no, we're just going to take a nice heroin nap. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you very much for me. If you want to hear more from me. You can listen to Beneath the Skin, the show about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. Listen to more episodes of this show where I am not the host and instead get to make jokes for an hour and a half. It's a, it's a good job to have. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you like what we do here, consider donating to our Patreon. Uh, you get episodes like this early. You get five plus years of bonus content, Discord access, stickers, uh, ebooks, all sorts of stuff. And leave us a review. On wherever it is you listen to podcasts, because it helps us immensely. And uh, until next time, complain to your terrorist leader why you can't have.